I'm often asked what makes the difference between a good React developer and a great React developer. And while there are obviously many differences that could be highlighted here, from a skill standpoint, I can't think of any faster way to go from good to great than by learning and mastering some of the tools that belong to what's referred to as the React ecosystem. The React ecosystem consists of a number of very helpful tools such as Redux, Thunk, Reselect, and many others that greatly simplify the task of creating large, performant React applications. And these are exactly the tools that this course will help you learn and master. To get the most out of this course, there are a few things that would be helpful for you to know. First of all, it would be very helpful to have a basic knowledge of React. If you haven't already worked with React a little, I'd recommend you take a look at one of the React Basics courses in the library first, and then come back to this one, since we won't be covering any of the very basics of React in this course. It would also be helpful for you to have some experience with basic command line operations. All we'll be using for this course is basic commands like cd to change directories and ls to see the contents of a directory, as well as a few commands specific to Node.js. Keep in mind also that if you're on Windows, the commands might be a little different. I've left you a link to an article showing many of the basic Linux commands and their Windows equivalents. I highly recommend that you follow along with me as I write code, but I've also included the start and finish states for all the code that I write in this course in the exercise files for your reference. So basically, this course is intended for React developers who want to improve their development skills and the quality of their applications by learning to use a number of pre-existing tools in the React ecosystem. If you fit that description, then this course is definitely for you. We're going to start off here by installing the major tools necessary for this course, and that's Node.js and NPM. These will be really important for running our code and installing a few libraries we'll be using to make our programming easier. So if you don't already have these things installed, you can download the installer from Node.js's website, nodejs.org. All you have to do is pick a version to download, and then once it's downloaded fully, you just click on the installer, and it should take you through the steps required for installation. And if you're using Windows or a Unix distribution, these steps might be a little different, but Node.js's website has instructions for all of these as well. Once you've run the installer, you'll want to make sure that you have the most recent version of NPM installed. We'll be using a few libraries in this course, and NPM is a package manager for Node.js that allows us to easily install them. If you've ever done React development before, you've definitely used NPM. So to install the most recent version of NPM, just open your terminal and type npm install-g npm, and you might need to add sudo before this. And once you've done that, you can just type npm-v, and it should show a version that's at least as high as mine. Don't worry too much if your version is higher than mine, since everything should still run correctly in that case. And that should be all we really need to do right now. We now have Node.js and NPM installed. If you decide to use the exercise files that I've included to follow along with the course, there are a few things you should know first. The first is that the exercise files are organized by video. So for example, the code for video 7 in section 2 will be in a directory called 02 underscore 07, and this will contain both the start and end state of the code in that video. Now, assuming you want to run the code for that video, there's a few steps you'll have to follow. The first thing you'll have to do is open up a terminal inside the directory you want to run. So if we want to run the end state of 0207, we would change into that directory by typing cd 0207 slash end. And then once we're in that directory, we need to run npm install and hit enter. And that'll run for a few seconds. But once it finishes, all you have to do is run npm run dev, and the application should run successfully. Another thing to note is that if you pick up the course sometime in the middle during section 4 or later, there's a server that you'll have to run locally in order for the code to work correctly. This code is available for download alongside the exercise files, and in order to actually run this code, you'll need to run npm install in that directory, just like we did with our exercise files. And once we've done that, you simply need to run npm run start and hit enter, and the server should start up correctly. So that should be all you need to know to run the exercise files for this course. 
As I mentioned before, this course is aimed at React developers who have spent most of their time developing with vanilla React and are now looking for a way to more effectively manage the many different concerns present in a full-scale React application. Now, I firmly believe that this is an important step toward achieving greatness and, well, sanity as a React developer when working on large, complex React applications. So, my hope for this course is to give you solid experience with some of the most important tools in the React ecosystem. This course aims to help you make sense of the numerous and incredibly useful tools available to the modern React developer, learn how to use them correctly, and incorporate them into your React development environment. To do this, we're going to start off by creating a basic React application from scratch, and then use this application as a jumping off point to learn about the many different tools that are available to us, including Redux, Thunk, Reselect, and Styled Components. We'll learn the basics of each of these technologies, such as how it works and why it's useful, and I'll walk you through the process of adding and integrating each one into your React project. And last but not least, because I'm a big believer in the importance of tests in any code base, we'll see how to test all the technologies that we cover in this course. So by the end of this course, you'll have a fully functional React project that you can use as a reference for all future React projects that you undertake. You'll also have the understanding required to use each of these tools effectively to write beautiful, maintainable, and performant React applications, and skills that will help you excel in a corporate environment where such tools are used regularly. Well, I'm really excited to get started on this with you, so now that we have our basic plan of attack, let's jump right in. Before we get started learning all about the tools in the React ecosystem, it'll be helpful for us to take a good hard look at why we might want to make use of these tools in the first place. After all, these tools do have a bit of a learning curve, and to some developers, it might seem like they make the development flow, well, a bit more cumbersome than usual. So, as I mentioned at the beginning of this course, Vanilla React, and when I say Vanilla React again, I'm just referring to Basic React without any of the additional tools that we're going to cover in this course. Vanilla React was designed as an effective way to create modular, performant user interfaces. And as I mentioned before, if we're talking about the model view controller pattern, React's main concern falls squarely into the view portion. That is, it provides a straightforward and powerful way to take some data and display it in the user's browser, as well as efficiently update what the user sees whenever the data changes. However, when it comes to how we load, store, and manipulate that data that we're displaying, React doesn't really provide us with much guidance. And this is actually somewhat on purpose. The idea behind this lack of opinion is that it allows React developers to make their own decisions with respect to the best way to load and manage data in their application and tailor React to their exact use case. The problem with this, though, is that it requires a lot of thought and experimentation to get it right, and in practice, developers rarely put that much thought into making these decisions. The end result is that all this logic ends up getting crammed straight into the components themselves. This means that what we usually end up with in a vanilla React application are these huge, tangled components that contain all the logic for loading and managing their own data, and this can make your React projects very hard to expand and maintain. So, if you've already put a lot of thought into organizing the code in your React project, and you've found something that works for you and your team, then you probably don't need all the tools we'll talk about in this course. However, if any of what I've mentioned so far in this video sounds familiar, and I've been at many companies where this is the case, so you're not alone, you'll probably benefit a lot from learning about the React ecosystem tools and incorporating them into your code base. So then, as you may have gathered so far, the name of the game when trying to organize a React application is separation of concerns. In other words, if we can find a way to effectively identify and organize the many different types of concerns in an application, this goes a long way toward making our code base more maintainable. This thinking, of course, is the basis behind patterns such as MVC, which I've mentioned already. And fortunately for us, a lot of thought has already been put into identifying and separating the concerns in React applications, and this has led to many of the ecosystem tools we'll be covering in this course. In fact, for most of the tools we'll look at, the underlying purpose for their existence will be this separation of concerns. So now that we know the basic benefits of using React ecosystem tools in our code base, namely that they help us effectively separate our concerns, we'll see exactly how to do this in later videos, Let's briefly go through each of the ecosystem pieces that we'll be covering later in the course. 
Keep in mind that the goal here is just to get a 10,000 foot view of each piece and how it fits into our code base. We'll go into much more detail about each individual piece later on. The first tool we'll be learning about and incorporating into our code base is called Redux. This is without a doubt the most popular add-on in the React ecosystem. Its main purpose is to help us manage the state of our React applications in an effective and relatively bug-free way. And to do this, it uses what's called the Flux architecture. A very fancy name for a pretty simple concept which we'll go into more depth on later in the course. The next tool is called Redux Thunk, or just Thunk by most programmers. What Thunk allows us to do is separate out the so-called side effects of our application. And side effects are permanent changes such as modifying user data on a server or upvoting an article, for example. And the idea is that this allows us to avoid putting this logic directly into our components. Again, separation of concerns applies here. Our components are meant to display our data, and that's it. They shouldn't be worrying about making network requests, and Thunk gives us a place to put this logic. Next up are selectors, and the specific library we'll be using for this is called reselect. While Redux takes care of managing and modifying the state of the application for us, the purpose of selectors is to abstract away the details of how our data is stored in the state. This will make more sense when we go in-depth with selectors later on in the course. And after that, we have what are called styled components. Styled components give us a nice way of, well, styling our components. That is, they give us a nicer way of managing the appearance of our components than using separate CSS files, particularly when the appearance of a component depends on the state in some way. Again, you'll get a much closer look at how this works later on in the course. 